some of the biology professors wanted to teach us. So like one was on genetics, one was on marine biology, one was on the morphology of dinosaurs, which was really cool. Um, and then we got one on uh, radiation and things like that. And one of the things that they kind of talk about related to your point about radium girls is that when they discovered x-rays, they did all of this ridiculous stuff with them. So it's like, you could go to a shoe store and they would like x-ray your feet just because they could, because they're like, look at this wonderful radiation. It doesn't cause any problems at all. And then oh, we find that radiation exposure is a huge carcinogen. So we don't do that as much. It's part of the reason why more places have MRIs than they have CAT scans at this point, because like MRIs are pretty safe if you know what you're doing. Remember, don't put any metal in your pockets. Don't cross your arms. Don't create a circuit. Hey, let me see your health pass. Of course. Are you a bunny? Yeah, unfortunately. You're not the first person I've seen showing up to class in a onesie. Onesies are so funny. <laughs> I, my friend gave me a Wonder Woman still being. It's okay. I had to wear a cow onesie for a play. And now I've and now I have this on film. Because <laughs> we are kind of taping this. So hey folks. Um I know that quite a few of you are having to quarantine right now. Huh? I know. I I believe you. I don't okay. believe you have anything to gain from lying to me. Okay. After I saw the numbers that shot up this morning, uh, this morning that email. Yeah. Be safe. Be smart. Make good decisions. That's uh, all I can really say. I will keep teaching in person until they tell me I can't. <laughs> You, you kind of have my word for that. Um, so really quick, um, before we really start finishing up PCP and ketamine, we only had a couple of slides left. Uh, I did want to show you your essay questions and your study guide. So these questions are selected from a pool. So the study guide will look a little longer as it, as it often tends to do because it's basically a pool of questions. But if you work through all of the study guide, you will be prepared for any possible question that you get. Um, so really quick, I'm gonna start with the essay questions and then I'll work through the study guide. We're not gonna talk about the study guide here. I will find time for a review session. Um, so how might cannabis act in the brain to impair memory? With respect to psychedelic drugs, how is a good trip different from a bad trip? And then I want you to describe the process of nicotinic receptor activation and desensitization via depolarization block. We talked about that. <laughs> I remember. Now, some of these are going to be a little bit more in your book than I went over them, and I'm happy to help you out with any questions that you might have. And then here is our study guide, and it looks like some of you have already pulled it up. Well done. Um, so nicotine and caffeine, marijuana and the cannabinoids, the hallucinogens, PCP and ketamine, and what we are starting this week, inhalants, GHB, and anabolic steroids. And hey, guess what? Next week, as a treat for all the hard work you've been doing, we are going to watch one of my favorite documentaries. We are going to watch Bigger, Stronger, Faster, which is largely about anabolic steroids and the supplement industry in general. I think you will find it very interesting. So I'm gonna to go to the library next week and get that and we will watch it here in class. Now here's what's really critical. I can't record this. I can share this on Zoom, but I can't record it because even though it technically falls under fair use, because I'm showing it for educational purposes, if I record it, it gets copyright claimed. Uh, I don't wanna do that. And I don't want to get copyright struck. I like my channel. I want to keep posting lectures and stuff. So if you're not able to make it, that's okay. We're not going to be, um, so I would say we're probably going to watch it Thursday of next week and Tuesday. So if you can't be here on Tuesday or heaven forbid, if more people get quarantined, fingers crossed that y'all don't, um, I will show it. You can zoom in and watch it with us but I cannot, um, I can't record it. Yeah. I was gonna say, sorry I should have been here earlier, but on Thursday, next Thursday I won't be here. That's fine. I'll be getting my visa up in Chicago. Okay, 
That's fine with me. Good luck. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Um, are you studying abroad next semester, by the way? I am. It's uh, a go right now. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I was like, why aren't you signed up for research methods? Now I know why. <laughs> huh? Yeah, I did. I forgot, though. I thought you were doing it later. Um, okay. So let's go ahead and finish our discussion of PCP. So if you've had biopsych with me, one of the things that you might find really interesting when we talk about long-term potentiation, and I show you the NMDA receptors that are really critical for that long-term potentiation. And for those of you who haven't had biopsychology, uh, long-term potentiation is basically the cellular basis for how memory and learning happen. Um, but when you look at the NMDA receptors, there's a PCP site. And many of you have occasionally wondered what that PCP site is for. Well, you get to find out today. <laughs> so NMDA receptors are ionotropic receptors for glutamate. That means that they basically permit the flow of ions like calcium and sodium to go into their cell when they're open. So normally, how the NMDA receptors work is that glutamate has to bind. You also have to have glycine or deserin bind. And then you need a slight depolarization to basically dislodge magnesium so that calcium and sodium can enter. So this is normally how an NMDA receptor works. Now here's what's interesting. If a PCP or ketamine binds to this binding site, it basically has the same effect that the magnesium block does. It's basically an antagonist to the receptor. So this means that calcium and sodium cannot actually enter the receptor and cause, uh, and cause different cellular effects. So it's part of the reason why we do tend to find that PCP and ketamine and taking those things is associated with different types of cognitive deficits, particularly uh, in the hippocampus and in the cortex, which contain a very large concentration of these receptors. So you will often find memory problems when you take these types of drugs. Does anybody have any questions on this? And by the way, thank you for your writing assignments. I graded them. Um, I did not get a, a few writing assignments from some people. Um, so if that's you and you didn't turn one in, turn it in soon, please. If you could try to get it to me before break, that would be awesome. Okay, so one of the other things that we know is that PCP and ketamine are very, very reinforcing. And this has largely been uh, demonstrated uh, in self-administration studies. And because they are reinforcing, this means that they have a very high potential for abuse. So you can kind of see this here, looking at different dosages of uh, ketamine uh, and a placebo here in red. So what you can kind of see is that the desire for a drug is very, very dose dependent. So you can kind of see that um, this lower dose of uh, ketamine, so this is 0.4 milligrams per kilogram, uh, actually creates a pretty high desire for the drug that peaks at about 80 minutes after administration. And then drug liking actually operates pretty similarly. Higher doses of ketamine don't really do that. And that's probably because, well, this is a dissociative anesthetic. Having high doses of an anesthetic are probably not gonna make you wanna do much of anything. And this reinforcement largely comes from, you guessed it, areas like the ventral tegmental area. So PCP and ketamine both activate dopaminergic cell firing in the midbrain and basically enhance dopamine release in areas like the limbic regions, as well as the prefrontal cortex. So what are some of the effects of chronic use? Urinary tract problems. Um, I don't know if you've ever had a UTI. 
they are not fun. I do not wish them on anybody. So you can have issues with the urinary tract. You will also find potential cognitive deficits, memory issues, damage to uh, both gray matter, which are made up of cell, uh, cell bodies, and damaged white matter, um, which are basically myelinated axons uh, in the brain. So you get these very telltale gray and white matter lesions, which show up as little holes. Sorry if the sense a little much, I don't think it is, but if it is, I apologize. All right, so that is it for PCP and ketamine. We are now going to talk about inhalants. And for those of you that are zooming in, you missed it. I played whip it before class. Oh, it's okay. Maybe the next time I'll play Let It Whip by uh, the Gap Band. Let it whip, whip it, baby, whip it, whip it, right? I, I don't actually do whippets. We'll kind of talk about why you really shouldn't do whippets uh, very, very soon. Uh, so let me go ahead and pull that up for you. Inhalant GHB and anabolic steroids. So inhalants. Now, is there anybody here? Don't be shy. I will not judge. Is there anybody here who has like sniffed a marker? Like legitimately <sighs> sniffed a marker? Every, I mean, I can sniff a marker right now. That is not what I mean when I say like sniffing a marker. I mean like, like that kind of sniffing a marker. Okay, good deal. And by the way, if you've ever wondered why you sometimes have to show your driver's license for things like markers and spray paint, this is why. Because teenagers like to huff things. <laughs> No, I'm not kidding. I am saying teenagers for a reason. There is data that shows that the average age of an inhalant user is 14. 14, which means that some are even younger. This is a thing that teenagers do because they can't, they're too young to try things like alcohol or nicotine. So here's kind of the overview for what we're gonna talk about today. So we have our inhalants. So we're gonna have the background and the behavioral and neural effects. If you've ever thought about huffing or sniffing anything, hopefully what I present today will kind of be, be a reminder, like don't, don't. Uh, gamma hydroxybutyrate or GHB, uh, it's been used as a club drug. It is also very famously, at least from when I was growing up in the 90s and the 2000s, it is also known as a bit of a date rape drug. Yikes. Um, and then we'll talk about anabolic androgenic steroids and why road rage, roid rage, road rage is a thing. Roid rage occasionally happens, but the data don't really back it up. We see it in animals. We don't really see it all that much in people. And I might actually show you a clip next time. So apparently Ben Affleck was in a TV movie about the dangers of steroids before he got really famous. And we'll show you some clips from it. You can watch Ben Affleck's roid rage. <laughs> okay, so we're gonna start by talking about inhalants. And folks, this is why. You have to show ID for things like markers and spray paint and stuff like that. So what are inhalants? They are a broad class of abused substances. They are typically everyday household items. The reason that they are likely to be used is because they are legal, they are easily available, and they are highly accessible. And the users, are typically going to be children and adolescents. The average age of a user of inhalants is 14 years old. I have occasionally, um, when I was in college, I would occasionally hear about people doing whippets, but very, very rarely. I was more apt at that point to hear about people getting high off of marijuana at that point, because well, 
college. Um, so here are a couple of different, um, some things that are commonly used for inhalants. Um, so let me take a look. All right, so what are some pretty common ones? Um, spray paint, markers, glue. I've heard about people huffing glue, uh, cleaning fluids. Now, here's the thing. People tend to not think of these as drugs because they're not used for getting high. Like if you're, if you're using cannabis for recreational purposes, the whole point of doing it is to get high. But with these kind of things that we're gonna talk about, they have other uses. But um, I would mention that part of the reason this happens, um, inhalants are cheap, they're easy to find, and also the body processes them really quick. So especially for kids uh, or teenagers who have parents that work, they can go home from school, get high off of an inhalant, and they'll be totally fine by the time their parents come home. And that's why inhalants tend to be used by children and adolescents because they're very, very fast acting. So inhalants are volatile liquids or gases at room temperature. And they are you, you basically use them by inhaling fumes in various ways. So um, a very common example is what I've referred to as a whippet. So a whippet, uh, a whipped cream can, um, people will take the nozzle of the whipped cream can when it's empty and basically sniff the uh, gas that is basically used in the aerosol can inside after the whipped cream's empty. Obviously, you don't want a nose full of whipped cream. Um, so this is part of the reason they get used. Um, they're either gonna be breathing in the fumes through their nose or their mouth. Um, this can be called sniffing. So you can sniff it, you can snort it. Um, in certain circumstances, depending on the uh, liquid or the gas, I have heard of instances where people will huff gasoline so what they basically do, no, I've heard of somebody who actually died this way, by the way. Um, they put gasoline in a plastic bag and then put the plastic bag over their head so they could huff the fumes. So this is what's referred to as bagging, but they ended up suffocating because when you breathe in different gases, you can potentially suffocate because you got no oxygen. Um, and then there's also huffing. Uh, it's basically they get different names um, based on uh, the way that you use it. So this will include things like paint thinner. This will include things like dry cleaning fluids, gasoline, lighter fluid, um, correction fluid like whiteout, uh, felt tip marker fluid, glue, spray paint, hairspray, deodorant spray, computer cleaning products, vegetable oil spray. Who is huffing Pam? <laughs> that is just, that is just sad. Um, different types of gases, butane lighters, propane tanks, whipped cream aerosols or dispensers, those whippets, um, ether, chloroform, nitrous oxide or laughing gas, um, ro room odorizer, leather cleaner. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, those are the big ones. Um, so here's what's really critical. These do not belong to another defined class of abused substances that can be inhaled through smoking. Yeah, you have a question? Um, yeah, you mentioned like snorting and sniffing. Yeah. What's the difference between the two? Um, so sniffing, sniffing kind of implies that you're just like, so maybe I'd, snorting would be, like taking the liquid and actually snorting it into my nose, like having liquid and just snorting a line of it like one would potentially snort a powdered cocaine, I think. And, and by the way, just as a friendly reminder, I tell you these things not because I want you to do them, but because this is how people do them, but please don't do them yourselves. You can get really bad brain damage this way, I promise. <laughs> not that I wish brain damage upon you, yes. So, like, if someone were to have MS, they're taking it for the disorder in the brain, 
Um, well, the effects are going to be really temporary, but one of the things that we know is that chronic inhalant use, and I'm kind of getting ahead of myself, can lead to white matter damage. Somebody with MS does not need that. Like really none of you need white matter damage. White matter is how all of the, uh, the different portions of your brain communicate with each other. You really don't wanna start introducing something like this into that system. Don't write this down. Um, here are some commonly abused inhalants. Here are kind of their gas names. Here are their uses. So things like acetone, which is present in nail polish remover. Uh, N-hexane, a degreaser, methanol, methylene chloride, which is a paint remover, naphthalene, which is in mothballs and toilet fresheners, uh, toluene, which we're gonna talk about quite a bit, it's present in spray paint, adhesive paint remover, butane, gasoline, kerosene, naphtha, propane, 1,1-difluorothane, uh, so that's compressed uh, gas computer duster, the little, the little can, um, tetrachloroethane, which are refrigerants, um, chloroform, ether, nitrous oxide, um, and then amyl nitrate um, and butyl nitrate, which are known as poppers. And we'll talk a little bit about poppers as well. So let's talk a little bit. Um, this will include volatile solvents, fuels, hydrocarbons, nitrites, and anesthetics. So volatile solvents are liquids at room temperature and give off fumes that are inhalable. So what you might find in a paint thinner. Fuels are volatile liquids or gases. Hydrocarbons are hydrocarbon molecules with one or more chlorine or fluorine atoms. So things like degreasers. The nitrites, as I've mentioned, are amyl nitrite and butyl nitrite. So those are your poppers. And so here's the thing, they talk about poppers, but I very, very rarely hear about people who do poppers. The last time I heard about poppers, I think was over the summer when Lena Dunham tried to share a story that she tried poppers. And it was kind of clear based on her story that she really hadn't. And, and that's like the only time I've ever heard about a celebrity reportedly doing poppers. So I'm calling them poppers. Um, part of the reason that they're called poppers is because of the, the sound that they make. Um, and um, part of the reason for this is that amyl nitrite was previously used as a heart medicine. And they were basically um, sold in these capsules that you would have to pop or crack to release the chemical. Um, but they're largely used for recreational drugs and they're pretty cheap. Um, they're actually often sold either as room deodorizers. They're also apparently sold as sex enhancers in adult shops. Yeah. But generally poppers don't really last very long. They only last like a few minutes. Um, so oftentimes people will take them with drugs like acid or ecstasy so that they can have a uh, kind of to enhance those longer lasting drugs. And then we have our anesthetics that includes nitrous oxide or laughing gas. I really don't like laughing gas at all. I had a root canal about four years ago and they tried to put me on laughing gas to kind, to kind of sedate me. And folks, I gotta tell you, it was the weirdest thing. So I got, the, I got these audio books because I knew they were gonna be working in my mouth for a while because they're basically, when you're doing a root canal, they're mummifying your tooth. They're basically opening up your tooth, they're sucking out, they're getting rid of the nerve, they're sucking out all the pulp, and they're basically mummifying it. Um, yeah, that's what a root canal is. It basically, when the pulp and the root are so damaged and diseased from bacteria and decay, at that point, they're just going to kind of keep 
the uh, overall structure of the tooth, but they basically scoop out all the nasty stuff and they fill it with like a resin or something like that. So for like the first couple of weeks after you get a root canal, it's the weirdest thing because you can feel sensation in your other teeth and you can't feel it in that one. And then your brain gets used to it. So it doesn't even bother me anymore, but they put you on nitrous. And so I have these audio books that I was listening to while they're drilling into my mouth. And of course I'm numb. I don't feel anything. So it was the weirdest sensation because I would be listening to a chapter and then all of a sudden I would be at the end of it. I'm like, it was almost like I was coming out. I'm like, that's the end of the chapter. How did that happen? And I started getting really paranoid. Like I thought I was going to faint. And they're like, do you want us to turn it off? I'm like, yes, I'm numb. I don't even care anymore. <laughs> so yeah, laughing gas doesn't make me feel very good. It makes me feel like I'm going to pass out. So I, as long as I'm numb, I don't care. <laughs> um, but we have nitrous oxide, we have ether, and we have chloroform. Um, if you want to knock somebody out, apparently, if you watch a lot of old movies and westerns, chloroform is one way that you knock somebody out. I was in a play where my character got knocked out by chloroform once. Not for real, of course. You don't do a massive amount. You don't want to do enough to knock you out. No. <laughs> okay. So inhalants are abused for a few major reasons. So if you live in a tiny little town like this and you're, you, you potentially want to get high and you're not really interested in doing meth um, and for other drugs, you might want a prescription or you have to know somebody um, and you want a really quick, cheap, easy way to get high, inhalants can do that for you because they're legal and they're very easy to find. Um, one of the other things that is a really high selling point, especially for kids and teenagers, is that their effects work quickly and they wear off quickly. So these are very rapidly absorbed and cross the blood brain barrier. They own their effects last for less than an hour. So like I said, for a latchkey kid who is waiting for their parents to come home, this is the perfect opportunity for them to basically get a quick high and then be completely fine by the time that their parents come back. Inhalant doses are often going to be calculated as the amount of the chemical that is in the air in parts per million or PPM. Right, everybody good? Okay, so let's talk about some of the different physiological effects of inhalants. So here's what's actually kind of interesting is that when you first take an inhalant, it's actually really similar to the effects of alcohol. Um, you feel a sense of euphoria, you feel pretty stimulated and you feel disinhibited. So your judgment kind of loosens a bit. So that's what we mean by disinhibition. Your, your judgment is less under your control. Um, but greater exposure and larger doses will cause stronger depressant effects. And this can include things like slurred speech, poor coordination, ataxia, and lethargy. So this very much looks like a heavy dose of alcohol. 
Um, and additionally, sensory distortions and hallucinations may also occur. Everybody good? Okay. Oh, sorry. I'll just sip on my high fructose corn syrup. It's one of those days, y'all. We good? Cool. Thanks, Casey. All right. So what happens with higher doses? Um, anesthesia, loss of consciousness, and coma. So yeah, these are not things you wanna mess around with. Also, I would add that one of the things that's really tricky with these is that they're a lot harder to dose because it's based on how you sniff compared to something where you can get a very clear, obvious dose because it's in a pill form or it's in a syringe form or things like that. Here, you can't really do that. It's all based on how much you sniff. So it's a lot less controlled. And because of that, it can be far more dangerous. So the frequency of use will generally modify the effects. So if you don't use uh, inhalants very much, so if you're what we call a low frequency user, you're largely going to report positive effects. You're mostly going to feel euphoria. But if you're somebody that uses on a pretty regular basis and you're what we call a high frequency user, there will be some positive effects, but there will also be some aversive effects, including things like depressed mood, irritability, or suicidal ideation. So tolerance and dependence is actually really rare. It's hard to develop a tolerance to these, and it's also very, very hard to develop a dependence on these, but occasionally some users do report um, developing a tolerance or a dependence. Having said that though, 
there is a withdrawal syndrome with inhalants. And that will include things like um, fatigue, nausea, irritability, and anxiety, sleep disturbances, and craving for more inhalants. So if you want to hear something kind of interesting, um, and this is actually kind of related to a lot of what we've been talking about lately with nicotine and stuff like that, uh, there's an article that came out in Vox uh, today that actually found that more Americans actually took up smoking during the pandemic. Um, certainly not many, but um, because of the rise of e-cigarettes, they were actually expecting um, cigarette use to actually drop by a certain percentage, I believe about four to six percent, and it only dropped to about half that, which means that some people must have picked it up. So they talk a little bit about what would potentially motivate somebody to pick up a habit that's really bad for your lungs during a pandemic in which the disease can really mess with your lungs. <laughs> so you might want to check that out. I thought it was pretty interesting, and I think you might enjoy it too. You need a minute? <laughs> I feel bad when I see somebody doing this with their hand. I'm like, I'm going to give them carpal tunnel. Like Casey's going to show up one day with her arm and her brace, like her wrist and her brace. And I'm going to feel so bad. Okay. That's good to know. That is good to know. Okay. So how is inhalant substance use treated? Uh, we don't actually have any specific treatments for abuse or dependence. This is one of those things that is often regarded as something that kids do until they're old enough to get their hands on what we actually consider drugs. And so there's no, there's not necessarily a specific treatment for it. The typical approaches have been things like 12 step programs like Al-Anon or Narconon, um, cognitive behavioral therapy, motivational therapy, and I'd actually argue what's probably critical for a child or a teenager that is having a lot of fun with inhalants is probably getting their family involved and doing something like family therapy. All right. So one of the things that we know that's actually kind of surprising is that inhalants actually can be reinforcing. Um, researchers have actually looked at this with one type of solvent, toluene, which is present in things like paint thinners and degreasers um, and nail polish remover. So toluene was administered in mice and rats and so what you're looking at here is place pairing. So generally what we do if we wanna see if a drug is reinforcing is we'll do something called place conditioning. So we will administer a certain drug. Um, one of the things that you need to know is that rats and mice in general do not like to return to the same place they've been. That can be really dangerous for them. But if we give a rat or a mouse a drug in a particular spatial area, and they return to that area in the future, that indicates that they liked the drug and they found it reinforcing because generally it is not in the nature of a rat or a mouse to return to the same place unless they find reinforcement there. So here on your y-axis, 
You are looking at a preference for drug paired place. Higher numbers mean that they spend more time in that place. Negative numbers mean that they're going to a different place. So you can actually see in the control condition where the rats and mice are not being given toluene, you do not see a place preference. You actually see a preference for novel areas. Um, and so you can kind of see that here. Here are four different doses of toluene in parts per million. So 350, 700, 2,500 and 3,200. And you can see that in all cases, there is evidence for a place preference there indicating reinforcement. In particular, this somewhat medium level of toluene in parts per million seems to be more reinforcing than other dosages as the rats and mice spend the longest time there. So we get place conditioning. So that indicates that there is some reinforcement there. Additionally, animals will self-administer toluene via uh, an IV. And generally, if they self-administer, that means they like it. If they didn't like it, they wouldn't do it. Um, and, they, and it also enhances intracranial self-stimulation. So just as a reminder, intracranial self-stimulation is when we take a microelectrode and we basically put it in the area of the nucleus accumbens and a rat finds that very pleasurable and will stimulate that microelectrode to get more of that reward type feeling. So what this means is that if we give toluene to a rat, they actually engage in greater intracranial self-stimulation than at baseline, indicating that this has a pretty powerful reinforcing effect. So what brain areas cause this reinforcement? And the quick answer is, we don't know. <laughs> Science is all about the I don't know. Um, but if you had to, if we have to guess, and we're talking about reinforcement, I would argue that the ventral tegmental area of the midbrain is probably involved. So it's possible that toluene uh, activates dopaminergic neurons, which enhances dopamine release onto areas in the forebrain, including the basal ganglia, the striatum. So the striatum is part of that basal ganglia. It's made up of the caudate and the putamen, the nucleus accumbens, and the prefrontal cortex. And this activity on the basal ganglia might potentially explain some of the uh, difficulties with motor movement. Also because um, inhalants, are basically depressants. And so they're going to slow down brain activity associated with movement. Okay, everybody good? All right. So as I kind of mentioned, it is a depressant. It does have similar depressant effects to alcohol. Uh, toluene by and large is the most commonly abused inhalant. Um, one of the things that we know is that it is a non-competitive antagonist for NMDA receptors. So that means it's going to reduce uh, glutamate binding, which means um, potential damage to cognition at least temporarily. We also see increased activation of the GABA-A receptors. And remember that GABA is by and large an inhibitory neurotransmitter. And it also will inhibit nicotinic receptors for uh, acetylcholine. Ooh, interesting. 
Um, another study that I, that I also kind of read about today, um, there's a device that allows people to safely hyperventilate, which speeds up clearance of alcohol, which can potentially uh, undo the effects of uh, severe alcohol poisoning. Yeah. Um, okay. So let's see. Um, the lungs play a role in eliminating alcohol. Remember that 5% of alcohol is released through the breath, through the lungs. Um, so blood saturated with alcohol reaches the lungs to be replenished with fresh, fresh oxygen. Uh, the alcohol in the blood is then exhaled. Um, this can actually be sped up through hyperventilation. So breathing quickly, but the problem is, is that when you hyperventilate, you're also breathing in a lot of carbon dioxide. And most of us do not have a very high tolerance for carbon dioxide. There are some people that have actually suggested that when you hyperventilate, so sometimes for some of us, hyperventilating can cause panic attacks. Some people have actually suggested that it has less to do with anxiety and it has to do more with a very, very low threshold for carbon dioxide. So by allowing people to safely hyperventilate without getting too much carbon dioxide, the idea is that you can help clear alcohol out of the lungs at a faster rate and thus potentially avoid things like severe alcohol intoxication. Yes, Casey. So like the brain is the mass, um, mm -hmm. Um, now I don't know about that. Um, I was going to say, if you're interested in learning more about like some of these theories about carbon dioxide and stuff. Um, so I listened to this on audiobook a couple of months ago. It's called Breath, the Lost Science of a Newfound Art or something like that by James Nestor. And they actually talk about some of the ideas related to carbon dioxide tolerance. So there's like breathing out there, like Wim Hof breathing, which is all about basically hyperventilating and then holding your breath. So I've actually done it sometimes. I can hold my breath for like two minutes if I practice enough, which is kind of horrifying. Uh, my partner asked, is that safe? Um, the idea is that you've built up so much oxygen from the hyperventilation that you can handle holding it for a little while. But I would say with masks, honestly, this is a great time to learn how to breathe deeply, breathe calmly. And additionally, one thing I would mention, breathe with your mouth closed. You were not meant to breathe through your mouth. You were meant to breathe through your nose and the book talks all about why that is. Um, but in general, you really shouldn't be breathing with your mouth. And that might have something to do with it as well. Anyway, that's an interesting digression. It's also very science-y. <laughs> okay, so chronic use will lead to your body basically becoming better at breaking down uh, these inhalants. So because GABA is involved, uh, the GABA receptors are basically gonna cut their numbers and NMDA receptors are going to start increasing their numbers. Now remember, NMDA receptors are excitatory, which means you're going to potentially put yourself in a lot of trouble because of this up uh, this upregulation of NMDA receptors. Remember that too much excitation can be really, really bad for your body. Okay. Um, the mechanisms of action here are also not very well known. And part of the reason for that is there's just too many different types of inhalants out there. There's so many different types that we, their, their mechanisms of action are largely going to be different from each other. And because of that, because there are so many, it's very, very hard for researchers to study them because they're all going to be different from each other. 
Now, one thing that we do know that all inhalants have in common is that they are all incredibly lipid soluble. And what this means is that they are going to be very, very rapidly absorbed from the lungs, entering the brain and having very, very quick effects because that's what inhalation does. Inhalation is a pretty quick route of administration, especially when your drug is lipid soluble. All right, so what does this look like in the brain? So what we're looking at here is a toluene concentration oh, in the brain of a, ba -ba -ba, a, ba -ba -ba -ba, of a baboon. There we go, blah, blah. Um, and what you can kind of see here, areas of high toluene concentration are gonna be in yellow, orange, and red. Um, and so this is in a PET scan, and I know it's kind of hard to see, just take my word for this. Um, there's very high uptake of toluene in the striatum, so the basal ganglia, the thalamus, and the cerebellar nuclei. Um, and this is really important. You have to figure out what parts of the brain are involved, where areas of these uptake are going to be highest, if you want to know the effects. So we can probably guess that if the basal ganglia, areas of the cerebellum, and possibly the thalamus are involved, we're gonna have some sensory issues and we're probably gonna have some motor issues as well. So what sort of behavioral effects actually happen with uh, toluene, since that seems to be the one that we know the most about? Um, so I mentioned that if you have high amounts of uptake in areas like the striatum and the uh, cerebellum, that you're probably going to have something related to motor activity. And it turns out that that is true. Um, we tend to find that um, there is increased locomotor activity, so they do move more but this is largely a dose dependent effect. So up to 1000 parts per million, we do tend to see increased activity. Anything above 1000 parts per million, we actually see sedation and slowing down of activity. And other inhalants such as ethanol, which is present uh, at least 10% in Missouri gasoline, uh, can also produce very similar effects. Ethanol comes from corn. I remember hearing about that when I was a kid and I thought, why can't we use corn gas? Wouldn't that be safer for the environment? I'm like, no, it's still gas. <laughs> Um, do you need me to give you a minute? How about we take a minute or two to just stretch for a second? I feel very bad. Like you play softball, you have to throw things. And by making you write as much as I am, I feel like I'm ruining your softball career. And I Oh, Lord. And in class, I would just write all the words, like, all 
So I got used to writing a lot, but like here it's mm -hmm. only like certain classes that I took like uh -huh. a lot of notes in. So it's like only this one and uh my anatomy class. Mm -hmm. All my other ones are just kind of like <laughs> eh. so I'm just like my hand like got away from not like writing as much. Like my palace on my hand isn't as big anymore. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay, don't write this down. <laughs> um, so, or at least write less. Um, so for humans, what we tend to find in terms of the effects, there are gonna be four different stages. So in the very first stage, we get very stimulant like positive effects like euphoria and excitation. Um, by stage two, we start to get the alcohol like effects. And some of this is absolutely going to be dependent on dosage and how often you use them. So alcohol like effects include disorientation, slurred speech, confusion. You can get hallucinations, but they're pretty rare. Um, in stage three, you get enhanced depressant effects that includes blunted sensation, poor motor coordination. And then finally, if you get to stage four, that's basically overdose. That includes stupor, loss of consciousness, seizures, failed breathing, and potentially cardiac arrest. This is why you shouldn't do inhalants. Your heart can stop. So what are some of the health risks of inhalants? Um, one of the big things, and this is actually the name of it, sudden sniffing death syndrome. So we don't exactly know why this happens. There are a couple of different ideas, um, but people basically develop a cardiac arrest after a single use. So one of the things that has been potentially mentioned for sudden sniffing death syndrome is that sometimes this happens because um, kids or teenagers will be sniffing and then their parents come home and then basically they go into cardiac arrest because of the shock. But basically you could potentially have this cardiac arrest happen anytime that you try an inhalant. Inhalants cause your heart to beat rapidly, those stimulant-like effects, and it also causes them to beat erratically. Additionally, um, we do know that this will lower your oxygen levels, so suffocation is absolutely a possibility. Um, what we do know is that repeated use can damage your heart, your liver, your kidneys, your lungs, and even your bones. So I will mention this too. Sudden sniffing death is most common uh, for people that are using butane, propane, aerosol chemicals or air conditioning coolant. Um, some other dangers can be convulsions and seizures, as I mentioned, suffocation, also asphyxiation.
Um, now, what are some of the long-term health effects? Uh, we know that the white matter is especially affected. So you can have things like white matter degeneration. So um, we were talking about multiple sclerosis, which is basically a disorder in which um, axons basically degenerate and lose their myelin, which means that the speed of the neural impulse slows down. So if you have multiple sclerosis, you're already having issues with your white matter because it's degenerating. Um, doing something like an inhalant is probably only going to make that worse, but this would be true whether you had multiple sclerosis or not. Frequent common use will lead to white matter damage. Um, you can also develop a cerebellar dysfunction as well as nerve damage. Um, another thing that we know is that anemia can also develop um, due to bone marrow toxicity and also deactivated B12, um, which is especially true if you are taking nitrous oxide. Um, B12 is a pretty important um, mineral and a vitamin that you need. Um, it's part of the reason why if you go vegan or vegetarian, you need to be taking a B12 supplement because damn it, uh, not having enough B12 in your system can lead to cognitive problems and it can also lead to nerve damage. Everybody good? Okay. So uh, toluene, additionally, if you have used that, um, it is associated with cognitive impairments as well as motivational impairments, similar to the amotivational syndrome that we talked about in, um, that we talked about when we mentioned cannabinoids. Additionally, cognitive function uh, may recover if you have several years of abstinence from inhalants. Would it be like, uh, huh? Would it be like a Um, well, I mean, if you've got white matter damage, not so much, mm -hmm. but I think if there's not white matter damage, I think that's a little bit different. We good? All right. So we, here are some different neurological symptoms and associated MRI findings in uh, chronic abusers of toluene. So we see things like apathy and inattention, some of those motivational issues. This is largely due to overall atrophy of the cerebellum, the cerebral cortex, and the brainstem. We have memory impairments. We do tend to see enlarged ventricles, and that also kind of fits with the concept of atrophy. And then problems with visuospatial processing, and this is largely due to gray and white matter damage. So yeah, not that you would ever be, I, I don't think any of you would potentially be tempted to huff paint, but if you were thinking about it, hopefully everything that I've shared with you here is a big enough deterrent, not to mention sudden sniffing death syndrome. You could 
you could just do it once and that would be enough. It's not a myth. <laughs> All right, so one of the other things that we know is that it can also affect fetal development. Um, for people who are abusing inhalants that give birth to infants, these infants are often gonna be born prematurely and they often tend to have lower birth weights. Uh, interestingly enough, they do have some of the same physical malformations of the head and face that we find in fetal alcohol syndrome, such as that missing uh, nasolabial fold, uh, extra epicampal folds uh, around the uh, inner corner of the eye. Um, trying to think of the other facial issues. I know they are. Let me take a look. Having a short nose, like a nose that's probably shorter than it should be and not very long. Um, so for this reason, it's sometimes referred to as um, fetal solvent syndrome because it has a very, very similar sort of thing. Um, so some of the different facial malformations that we see uh, will include things like a flat mid face, a short nose, a thin upper lip. Um, a missing nasolabial fold or a very shallow one, um, some slight ear abnormalities, and a low nasal bridge. And small eye openings as well, and generally a pretty small head. We got about eight minutes, we can do it. And yet somebody is doing yard work and it's almost dark. The same, right? I will tell you, um, for those who are a little prone to feeling a little blue because it's now dark at five o'clock and that's not right. Um, I bought a light therapy lamp on Amazon for about 30, 30 bucks and I use it every morning. And so far I felt pretty good. So if you're prone to kind of getting the winter blues, that's one possibility. I didn't say it was about cold. I don't like the dark. That's where the Babadook lives. <laughs> nah, that's where the Babadook lives. No, thanks. <laughs> I just watched it and I totally called it. Like it's about grieving. <laughs> okay. So we'll start by talking about GHB or gamma hydroxybutyrate. Okay. So GHB is actually very similar to GABA. So just call it GHB, don't write out gamma hydroxybutyrate. It's actually structurally similar to the neurotransmitter GABA. So GHB is actually produced in the brain as a byproduct of GABA metabolism. So here is the chemical structure of GABA. Here is the chemical structure of GHB. Um, what you're looking at here is a molecule of gamma butyrolactone. Um, generally, it's used uh, for the production of other chemicals. Um, it's a common solvent in nail polish remover, stain remover, circuit board cleaner. Huh, kind of sounds like the inhalants. <laughs> And then 1,4-butanediol um, is a primary alcohol. It is one of four stable isomers of these. It is typically used as a solvent and in manufacture of different types of plastic, elastic fiber, and uh, polyurethane. And it's basically used uh, in the synthesis to create GBL. 
So here are the steps in GABA meta uh, metabolism. So we start with GABA. Then we have uh, an enzyme. In this case, it's GABA aminotransferase. This is broken down into succinic semialdehyde. And so we have two different enzymes here. So succinic uh, semialdehyde reductase basically creates GHB. And then succinic semialdehyde dehydrogenase produces succinic acid. So when GABA is metabolized, it basically turns into GHB and succinic acid. You good? Okay, so GHB can actually be taken into GABAergic vesicles by uh, the vesicular inhibitory amino acid transporter or VIAT. And some GHB can actually be co-released with GABA when the neuron fires. So you actually make GHB, but we're not talking about that kind of GHB. We're talking about the kind that is synthesized and used uh, originally as a fitness supplement and is later used as a club drug and also for more nefarious purposes. So one last slide and we'll call it a day. So GHB was basically discovered during a search for a GABA analog to be used for therapeutic purposes. And as I mentioned back in the 1980s, uh, it was actually sold as a dietary supplement for bodybuilders of all things. Now that's actually kind of curious. Why would you want something inhibitory uh, for something that's as intense as building your body and changing your body composition and building muscle. And the reason that this was basically sold as a supplement is because GHB helps deepen sleep. And the deeper the sleep that you get, the greater growth hormone that is released, which means that if you're a bodybuilder, that extra growth hormone can help you with that body composition. All right, folks, that is all we have today. So you can finish writing this down. And when you are done, uh, if you haven't turned in your PSA yet, please get that to me soon. I'd like to show these off on Monday. Uh, if you would like me to not show yours off, please shoot me an email. It won't negatively affect your grade if I don't show it, but I'd like to show off most of them. Um, so have a wonderful weekend, stay safe, make good decisions, 
Um, if you need me for anything or you need my help with anything, just let me know. And I will see you here again on Tuesday. Everybody take care. Stay safe. I care about you. Take care of yourselves. Take care of each other. And I'll see you next time. Bye, everybody.